All right, uh, welcome to MABA Sunday Mornings. Uh, today is the 27th of November. I'm going to give a short talk today about um, an introduction to the platform sutra of the six lineage master. Sometimes they use the word patriarch. I tend to use the word lineage master. It's a less gender identifying. And in the Chinese, there's no gender to the term uh, lineage master will work just as well. So the reason I'm giving this particular talk as it's related to the Dharma for difficult times is that um, we can learn some lessons from the past and we can learn lessons from the present as well. We're going to be studying the Platform Sutra this winter during the traditional rains retreat, which in St. Louis, we uh, do this retreat during the winter season, that it's raining here. This is a time where we will uh, focus more deeply on our meditation practice. And also on our study, we combine the meditation practice with our investigation. These are the two first two of the seven factors of enlightenment. And if we do so diligently, if we combine our meditation and our study and we do that diligently, then we have the possibility of joy rising up from within. I think this is very possible. So we're going to study the uh, Platform Sutra, one of the most important texts. And we're going to, uh, we're going to be studying the, the Dongwan Tanjing manuscript, but I do want to say some things about uh, the uh, the Qizong, or the, or the QZK manuscript that we'll be looking at as well. I want to compare some of that today. So if we look at that, uh, we'll see, I'm going to divide my talk into three parts with a little introduction to begin with here. But we're going to be talking about the, uh, the opening verses of the platform sutra, comparing the Dongwan and the QZK um, it's a little funny to use the word, uh, to use to say Q because it's a Q in Chinese, it's a CH sound, uh, so Qizong, but uh, we'll call it Q for our purposes. And then I want to talk about uh, Hui Nang's enlightenment and the Diamond Sutra. I need to make some uh, um, amends for some of my earlier mistakes having heard different stories from different people about this uh, over the years, I uh, got some things confused and confabulated and I'm going to straighten that out today. Hopefully uh, undo some of uh, any negative karma I've created. And then the uh, final version of the, the, the final verses of the Diamond Sutra, I wanna talk about that as well. So in the next slide, we talk about the history of the diamond, uh, of the platform sutra. And we can see that it was um, spoken by Hui Nang, who lived from, we believe, around 638 to 713 CE, who gave this um, lecture at uh, Dafan Temple when he was around 40 years old. Um, somewhere around uh, 678. So this was a maybe, uh, if, he, if he had his, uh, uh, received the lineage master, um, Robin Bowl, as we'll find out when he was around 24. So you can see he had already been uh, uh, well along in his uh, giving teachings. So this particular sutra was transcribed by uh, Fahai, as, as we, Fahai, 
we don't we don't know too much about him, but we do know that uh, Shen Wei, who was later uh, he was the person who really promoted the Southern School, um, this uh, Southern School of uh, Enlightenment, and he was a person who uh, thought that the Southern School was superior to the what was called the East Mountain School at the time, but later became known as the Northern School of uh, Shenzhou. And he, he promoted that, uh, that Hui Nang was superior uh, to um, this, but this, we, we know now that um, this was really uh, Shen Wei's idea, not uh, Hui Nang's. We're going to be looking at, uh, you know, during our study group, we're going to be looking at the uh, different translations, but a little bit, but the, uh, the Dong Wan, uh, this came out of the, the caves, well, both of them actually came out of the caves, but this uh, Dong Wan, as it's called, um, there is uh, the version that we're going to be using, it has a Chinese on one side and English on the other, so we can kind of compare that. Uh, unfortunately, this text is not readily available in, uh, if you, uh, we, I think we got either Taiwan or Hong Kong, uh, we had some copies of Mob, I don't know if we still do, uh, but in any event, if you can't get it, we'll try to make the, the information available. We, we are going to make a PDF, but we're not going to print it out for purposes of respecting the copyright, but we can use it for our teaching. And if you want to follow along with another very good translation by Red Pine, that's, uh, that's readily available as well. Uh, so that's the other text. So there are these two manuscripts that we can talk about. Um, these are two editions of Dung Wan uh, and the uh, QZK editions. The Dung Wan um, Mogwa Caves, okay, where the places where the, these versions of the Platform Sutra were found, and they're dated between 830 and 860 uh, CE, and uh, they both are derived from a, uh, from a manuscript in, from 780 CE, uh, and they were uh, unearthed uh, in 1907. Prior to this discovery, uh, Qizong, um, who was a Ming Dynasty uh, a teacher, uh, he was a uh, uh, Dharma heir to the uh, uh, Man Chan school. He had put uh, together a longer edition of this manuscript. And then uh, in 1291, uh, Zong Bao, uh, constructed a Ming Dynasty version uh, based primarily on the longer uh, Chizan edition known in Japan as the uh, Koshiji uh, text. Actually, uh, go, going back, Chizan was uh, later in the Tang Dynasty. So, um, so we can see there are uh, this, this longer version, we're, we're going to see how it it's so different from the uh, Dong Wan version in just a moment. So uh, in the next slide here, the Platform Sutra became one of the most influential texts of the uh, Chan Zen tradition. Uh, the discourse uh, given at the Dafan Monastery in uh, Shaozhou Temple is attributed to the six Chan lineage master of Wenyang. The most uh, important topic of the discourse is a sudden enlightenment, uh, the, the direct perception of one's true nature and the unity in essence of uh, sila, which is a morality, dhyana, uh, meditation, concentration and prajna wisdom. And the so-called uh, Sudden Enlightenment Southern School of Chinese Buddhism is based on this uh, doctrine uh, that became extremely influential uh, 
you come. So um, there are in the Taisho, in the in, in the complete uh, version or nearly complete version of the of what we have of uh, the the text in uh, classical Chinese. Uh, T zero zero seven is the Don Juan manuscript, and the T two zero zero eight is the longer version. And uh, we know that the. As we see, we have a number of different translations of the uh, Don Juan. The one translation that I know of, of the, uh, the QZK version that I would recommend is the one by John McCray. So if we look at the next here, that this was uh, published by Numata, the, the BDK um, uh, Berkeley group. Um, this is a uh, this is the Don Juan version. And again, this is uh, a text that you can purchase from uh, Numata, but also um, you can also get a PDF of this as well. John McRae, unfortunately, uh, passed away when he was rather young. And uh, so he's not around to give us further uh, edification on the text. So who was Hui Nang? Okay, he was a. Uh, a Chinese monk who was one of the most important figures of the Chan tradition. He was said to be originally an itinerant uh, wood uh, cutter, he sold cut wood, he was awakened upon hearing the recitation of the Diamond Sutra. Now, at the beginning of the Platform Sutra, the first portion is about his uh, background in history, so we'll look at that. He went to study with the Chan master Hong Run, who eventually became, and he and Hui Nang eventually became the Dharma heir of this teacher. And um, thus is said to be the sixth lineage master. He advocated sudden approach to uh, Buddhist practice and enlightenment. And in, the, in this regard, he's considered the founder of the suddenest Southern Chan school. This work, which is attributed to Wei Nang, the Platform Sutra, ended up becoming one of the most influential texts in East Asian meditation tradition. So now I want to do part one of my talk here, the opening of the Platform Sutra, comparing uh, the Dong Wan and the Qiz ZK manuscript, and you'll see here in the next slide that uh, at the very beginning of the Dong Wan manuscript, the great master uh, said, my good enlightening friends, contemplate the Dharma, the Maha Prajnaparamita, which is the, the highest wisdom perfection, with a pure mind. This is what he advised. This is how, how this text begins at the first line. But in the QZK edition, the opening section begins this way. When the great master arrived at Baolin, uh, the part of the prefect way, and uh, the original, uh, the official staff entered uh, the monastery, invited the master to come to the lecture hall at Dauphin, uh, within the city when he was, uh, he could tell us his story and preach the Dharma for those assembled. And the master took his seat, uh, the prefect and, and the official staff, more than 30 in number, and Confucian scholars, more than 30 in number, and the monks and the nuns and the lay people, more than a thousand in number simultaneously did obeisance, they bowed to him and beseeched him to relate the essentials of the Dharma. You see how much more expanded this is. And then the great master says to the assemble, the good friends, Bodhi is fundamentally pure in its self nature. You must simply use the mind that you already have and you will achieve Buddhahood directly and completely. So you can see that there is a difference here 
in the approach in these two particular versions. I just want to point this out. I, I don't uh, want to say which one is right or which one is not right. I just think that they're both very interesting to look at. So when we talk about the suddenness school and we talk about this uh, idea of um, uh, yeah, as we look at this next slide, we can see that perhaps we need to understand a few things about an awakening and what awakening means, because sometimes the word enlightening just, you know, we have one idea of what enlightening is, but in fact, there are five different types of enlightening in the Yen school, for example, we talk about different types of enlightenment. This is a talk in and of itself, and I don't want to go too much into this, except to say th that uh, it's not just uh, one type of enlightenment. And uh, in the Japanese school, they also have different terms for different stages of one's enlightenment. Okay, going to the next slide, John McRae has a commentary on the Mahaprajna piece. He, he explains that Mahaprajna Prajna, great wisdom, is to refer to the very center of the mind. Prajna is the expedient means of the sage, the great wisdom of the sage. Okay. And in the next slide, we can see that uh, the six perfections that we're talking about here, Prajna is the Maha Prajna integrates all of the other perfections, generosity, morality, patience, effort, and concentration, puts them all together, and we have the wisdom. There's so much more to be said, but I want to go on to part two, which has to do with uh, Hui Nun's sudden awakening. And here I must say that I was confused by some of the stories that, uh, that I heard or confabulated or put together in my own mind. And I'm now going to have an opportunity to correct that. Because I had originally talked about how when uh, Hui Nang heard the Diamond Sutra chanted for the first time when he was a woodcutter, he was awakened by the verse in the 10th chapter of the Diamond Sutra. But as it turns out, this is not exactly true. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll see why that's the case and where the correction can be made. Okay, so <clears throat> here uh, there's a hearing of the Diamond Sutra while he was uh, delivering wood and then uh, hearing the verse from chapter 10 of the Diamond Sutra of Hong Ron, uh, this actually happened later when he was at the East Mountain Monastery at age uh, 24 uh, in 661 when he was conferred. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So in the next slide, uh, in uh, section nine of the Dong Huan manuscript, uh, Hui Nang receives the Dharma, and this is what is said. At midnight, the fifth patriarch called me from his chamber and preached the Diamond Sutra to me. As soon as I heard it, I was awakened. Okay. That's all that's said about this particular experience. Now, McRae's translation of the QZK manuscript goes like this. The patriarch kept his robe hidden and would not let anyone see it. He preached the Diamond Sutra for me. This is when, he, uh, in an earlier section, he says that the, the Hong Run came to him and uh, told him to come to his chamber at the third watch of the night. So this is when he comes in. Uh, when, he, when he reached the words, uh, responding to non-abiding yet generating the mind, I experienced a great enlightenment, realizing that all the myriad dharmas do not transcend their self-natures. I thereupon informed the patriarch of this saying, okay, so he gives it, he says to the, to the patriarch, no matter when the self natures are fundamentally and naturally pure. No matter when the self natures are fundamentally neither generated 
nor extinguished, no matter when the self natures are fundamentally and naturally sufficient unto themselves, no matter when the self natures are fundamentally without movement, no matter when the self natures are able to generate the myriad dharmas. Here, the dharmas are a phenomena. McRae has a note about this. Uh, the Chinese text of the Diamond Sutra, this is the QZK version, reads and and the Yin Mu Fu, Zhu Er Shang, Qi Sin. The Chinese, the English given here is based on the understanding of the line in contemporary Chinese Chan literature and is substantially different from the intent of the original Sanskrit. On the, on the Diamond Sutra. Diamond Sutra was originally written in uh, Sanskrit. So, um, so the correction that I want to make uh, very clear is, is that, that uh, Huinang received this awakening when he heard this particular verse, which is from chapter 10 of the Diamond Sutra, when he was with Hongran in East Mountain Monastery just before he received uh, the robe and bowl and not when he heard, or we, we don't know what he heard when he was listening to the old man recite this um, outside of the, uh, when he, where he delivered the wood. So I uh, want to make that very clear to correct myself. So what is the meaning of this verse? So the translation of this is done in many, many ways. The translation that I use personally myself is that they should not abide in or give rise to anything anywhere in the mind. But there are other translations of this verse. So the entire verse uh, comes from this chapter 10. So what comes before it, and Thich Nhat Hanh uh, translated this, the Buddha said, so Shubhuti, this is the monk that the Buddha is talking to during the Diamond Sutra. All the Bodhisattva Mahasattvas should give rise to a pure and clear intention in the spirit. When they rise to this intention, they should not rely on forms, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile objects and objects of mind. And here's the main verse. They should give rise to the intention with their minds not dwelling anywhere. That's uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's translation of this. Very good. Then Thich Nhat Hanh gives his uh, commentary. Not dwelling anywhere means not relying on anything. Giving rise to an intention means having the wish to attain the highest awakening. Relying on form, sound, smells, taste, touch, uh, and objects of mind means being caught by perceptions, ideas, and concepts. In section two of the sutra, the first question Shubhuti asked the Buddha was, if sons and daughters of a good family want to give rise to the highest, most fulfilled awakened mind, what should they rely on and what should they do to master their uh, thinking? This passage is the Buddhist answer. So Thich Nhat Hanh says, well, this is a very important line. So there are many translations. Um, Red Pine has a translation as well. Bodhisattva should thus give birth to a thought that is not attached and not to give birth to a thought that is attached to anything. Uh, Ogu of the Dharma Drun just simply says, no abiding, no arising. So there are many different ways of looking at this. Charles Muller, who's uh, the uh, person who puts together DDB, the Dictionary, the Digital Dictionary of Buddhism, a really amazing resource. He says, should generate minds that are not 
fixed on anything. Uh, so he goes into more detail uh, because of my time. I don't want to uh, get uh, so caught up in this. The actual literal translation of every word here uh, should not wherein abide and yet arise therein anything mind. Okay, that's where I get they should not abide in or give rise to anything anywhere in mind. But I think any of these translations are good. It's what your mind is able to understand from this. If if you have the best translation and you don't have a you're not awakened by it, then the translation will fall short. If you uh, have the great awareness, then oh, then you can become like Wayne Young, you can be suddenly awakened. So this sudden school of awakening that uh, Hui Nung talks about is really based on his own experience. He suddenly became the awakened. And there are other stories about other people who suddenly become awakened, but that doesn't mean that they didn't do the work beforehand. In Hui Nung's case, he, he credits it to his past karma. So he was just ready right at that moment to become awake. But for many of us, we have to do many, many years and maybe lifetimes of practice before we're right at that point where we're ready to become fully awake. So there's no conflict between gradual awakening or sudden awakening. They're just uh, two sides of the same coin, as we might say. We can go to the next part. Oh, so I have three minutes to do the next part. Okay, so uh, but maybe I'll take a little bit longer. The final verse of the Diamond Sutra uh, is uh, all composed things are like a dream, a phantom, a drop of dew, a flash of lightning, and that is how to meditate on them. That is how to observe them. And then um, what we can learn about is we can presume that when Master Hong Lung taught Hui Nung, he didn't stop with chapter 10. He, he completed the Diamond Sutra. He read all the rest of it to him, and he, he got to this last verse as well. We go to the next slide. And Thich Nhat Hanh has a commentary on this that's uh, quite extensive. It goes on for a couple of pages. and. Um, I don't want to read this entire commentary at this point because we have so much time uh, uh, left that we we don't we don't have time to do all of that. Maybe when we are studying together in the study group, we'll have an opportunity to go deeper into this uh, the, these two slides and also um, actually three slides. Maybe, uh, and then Red Pine also has a commentary on these last verses as well. So uh, uh, best that we maybe don't get into this at this moment because there's just so much here. Um, and then to understand Red Pine's commentary, you need to understand the three bodies of the Buddha the Dharmakaya, Sambhokakaya, and the Nirmanakaya, and that's a whole other level of, of stuff to get into to unfold. We don't want to go into that so much today. So all of this commentary. Uh, we can, uh, here, oh, Venerable Konkla is right with me here. The original Sanskrit translation by uh, Edward Kanza, uh, this is a uh, really interesting to look at as well. Uh, the, he translates this, this is, as stars, a fault in vision, as a lamp, uh, a mock show, a dew drops, or a bubble, a dream, a lightning flash, or a cloud, so should one view what is conditioned, conditioned reality, those things that are made up of all different levels namely all physical kinds of things that we look at, all conditioned. So, uh, and if you look at the, uh, every word in the, um, in the Sanskrit, you, you can see how it relates to the words in the Chinese, and you can see the correspondence between those as well. And if we go to the next slide, you can see a word by word translation of the, of the Diamond Sutra, 
uh, translation, every word as well. And that's where we get this re, uh, the, our, our teaching here. Now, when Thich Nhat Hanh uh, does the translation, he leaves out uh, a couple of words. Um, he leaves out the, um, the, the water bubble in the shadow, I believe, and a drop of dew. Uh, no, I think he has the water in the bubble is there, but he leaves out the shadow and the drop of dew. But that's okay. The, the, the essence is there in his translation as well. So uh, as we look further, we can see in the next in one of the slides that the Diamond Sutra, we have the English, the Chinese, the Sanskrit, and Kanza's translation as well. And so when we are chanting today, we will be chanting the uh, last chapter of the Diamond Sutra. So pay attention. When we get to this place, we will be chanting this in English, without, uh, without the, uh, a few of the lines, but we will be translating a few of the verses and then we will also uh, do it in Chinese as well. Um, so pay attention when that happens, you'll hear the gong is to kind of, oh, bring your mind right to this point. So uh, I wanna thank everybody for, uh, attending today and listening to this short talk. Thank you for listening and uh, please pardon me for my uh, hoarse voice. <laughs>